Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is great to um, to be here and be able to um, give you information on starting your own firm. I think everyone is um, either uh, a new uh, graduate of Southern University Law Center or um, is just looking to start their own practice. So welcome to our uh, first edi edition of Becoming Fierce in the Practice of Law and Building Your Office Edition. Um, so I'm Attorney Janara Morris. I am a professor here at Southern University Law Center. Um, this is my uh, third year, I think. I can't even remember. Um, but it's, it's, been, it's been a blast uh, working with students and um, molding young minds to understand what the law is uh, and how to uh, practice, how to have knowledge of the law. So um, I'm going to give you the knowledge that I have of starting a firm uh, and tell you how I started out. I actually started out, um, I was blessed to have a husband that is uh, comes from a background of attorneys. Uh, my father-in-law, um, Reverend Thomas Morris, allowed us to um, basically come to his office and start working there. And that's how I began. Um, I actually was the administrative assistant for my husband slash paralegal um, after I graduated because I had no idea that we were going to Mississippi, but we went to Mississippi. And so um, I had five years of shadowing my father-in-law, shadowing uh, my sister-in-laws, because I have uh, two sister-in-laws that are also attorneys that work in uh, work at Morrison Associates. And then we, we chose to branch out to move back. Um, and we branched out and began our own firm together, uh, my husband and I. So um, I've been, I graduated in 2005. So um, I've been doing this for a while. Uh, and so the blessing of it all was not only did I get to see the legal side of the business, but I also got to see the business portion of the business. And that's what you definitely need to understand that there is a business portion. Um, so what I'm going to do right now, um, y'all know if you've taken my class, I tend to, I can talk and I can talk a lot. And um, that's okay, you know, because that's what lawyers do. But um, I want to keep us on track and I want you to be able to ask questions. I appreciate, I definitely appreciate attorney um, Professor Dickerson for creating this because it is very important to you. Um, you definitely need to know how to be fierce in the law, in the practice of law and um, understand what it is that you need to do and uh, don't get caught with some of these pitfalls uh, that some attorneys do. And um, so you want to become a, uh, a solo practitioner, uh, have your solo office, and that is beautiful. Um, but we need to do some preliminary things before we do that. Um, and I want you to know that the, the individuals that are shown in this uh, slideshow are uh, actually graduates of Southern University Law Center. Um, so they're not models, even though they look like it, they are my students and they're the first class that uh, I actually graduated. Um, and so I'm, I'm very proud of them and wanted to pay homage to them um, today. But let's begin. So um, who are the people that are trying to start a law firm? Uh, we have this beautiful graduate, these graduates here um, that are starting their new attorneys. So they want to start a law firm. So where do they go? What do they do? Um, then we have individuals that may be starting over. They're attorneys that have been working in um, different fields, uh, firms, agencies, and different organizations. Well, okay, great. So where do we start? Let's look at where we start. If we're starting over or we're new graduates. I have a startup checklist for you. First, in establishing a firm, you must have a purpose. There must be a purpose for you establishing this firm. You don't just jump out and say, okay, well, I'm going to, what they call, hang my shingles. Um, you don't want to just jump out and say, okay, well, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to take a case and um, I don't have anywhere to go. I don't know what to do with it. Uh, there needs to be a purpose. Secondly, most importantly, this is the second point. You must have a mentor. You need a mentor. This is where we fault and, and fall a lot of times. We don't seek help. You must seek help. Um, and I'm going to talk about mentoring as well and how you choose a mentor and how that mentor will choose you. 
Uh, thirdly, we have to create a name. We have to have a name selection. Um, that is very important because um, certain rules of professional responsibility say that the name selection, um, there must be names, uh, a proper name selection. Um, and then fourthly, you must register your business and decide on number five is deciding on uh, the type of firm as well. So purpose, mentoring, uh, your name selection, registering your business and um, the type of firm that you want. And I'm gonna put on my glasses guys. I, I fight not to wear them, but I'm gonna put them on. Um, so, well, okay, so you, why are we starting a law firm? You've graduated, um, you are now or you're wanting to move on. Well, some reasons that people start law firms is freedom. They want freedom. Um, others, uh, they, they're just natural born leaders and they want to lead and they want to guide people. Uh, they want to do it on their own. Um, I, I tend to think I am a natural born leader. Uh, I like to do things on my own. I, I love working and I love working and helping people. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, especially in this day and age where people don't like to help people. But I, I mean, I feel like I, I know that it's a gift from God that um, that I've gotten to be a leader. Um, some people want to make a difference. That's one of the reasons that I wanted to. I knew from law school, sitting here in Southern University Law Center, I knew that I would I wanted a soul. I wanted to be a sole practitioner. I wanted to work for myself. Uh, because I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to help other people and I'm a leader. Uh, you might want to specialize in uh, one area of law. Maybe you work uh, in, a, in a, the uh, tax office, Department of Revenue, uh, as an attorney. You say, okay, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, I'm more interested in criminal law or I'm more interested in patents or trade um, trademarks. Um, so you want to specialize in, in a different area of law. Uh, you want to challenge. You're tired of the mundane just going to work, uh, doing this, and you do it every day, so you want a challenge. And then some people do it for money. That's a bad reason. I just want you to know it's a really bad reason uh, because within the first, uh, I would say the first year, you, you really take a loss when you're starting uh, your own business because you're learning budgeting, uh, you're learning what you need, what you don't need, what you can, um, what you can do without. So uh, that, may, that, that presents an issue if you just wanna make money. Um, a lot of students come and I look at them, I say, oh, they're so cute. Um, you know, they come dressed and I'm like, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, we, we don't just start off making money. Um, but, or you want to just be your own boss. You're tired of office politics. You're tired of uh, just working for someone um, and you're not making the type of money that they're making or you're not, uh, you don't feel fulfilled. So that's another reason that people uh, start their own law firm. Um, you need to decide on what your, what your reason is, but you must have a purpose. And the first purpose I would say is to help people. You have to remember that these are your clients and your job is to help them and make sure that they are okay uh, at the end of the day. Um, you're not going to win every case. It's not going to happen, but you need to be open and honest with your clients and let them know um, if, if something is going to happen. That's, that's a whole nother um, tangent, but uh, you do need to be open, and honest, and your purpose needs to be to be diligent and something that you have heard many of times, be diligent and have a seriousness of purpose. Um, so you have you found your purpose, you understand your purpose. Now, the most crucial part of a law practice, we want to find a mentor. Um, and or you want to establish a legal support team. What is important about a mentor? That mentor will guide you through the process. Um, they'll, they'll be able to tell you not, not the law, not the law. A, a mentor is just like a professor. They're going to tell you, I remember my father-in-law used to tell me all the time, I would go in and he, he would frustrate me because I would go in and I would ask him a question. And he'd ask me a question back and I'm like, just tell me the answer, sir but he forced me to go out and research. 
he forced me to go out and say, okay, you can do it on your own. Now, did I want that all the time? No, I didn't. Um, do I approach some of my students like that? Yes, I do. Y'all know I do. Um, but I also felt um, that this research enabled me to be independent and to be on my own and be able to function on my own. So there was guidance through that process. You need that guidance through the process, not just the legal portion of it, but the business portion. Someone that has done it already can tell you, these are the pitfalls. This is what could happen. Not that it will, because if you get a naysayer that's um, a mentor, then you just, you'll never start the business. Um, you need someone that, that loves what they do, uh, they want to see young attorneys be successful and you'll be able to spot them um, right off the bat. Um, and you also need to establish a legal support team. It could be your classmates. You can say, look, after, after we graduate, we're going to make sure that we're okay. If you have a question, I'm here to answer it. Um, I want, you know, we'll, we'll start our business together. We'll, you know, whatever it is, but you need that support system. But now the point of the mentor is someone that has experience. Don't go out and say, okay, my classmate is going to be my mentor. No, your classmate can be a part of your legal support team, but they cannot be your mentor. They don't know anything either. Now, maybe they have gotten some information and that's fine, but don't take that person as the person that I'm going to um, put everything and invest everything in this person and listen to everything that they say. And if someone tells you something, of course, then you need to go and research it and find out, um, is it true? Uh, or is it a misinterpretation? You understand that as an attorney, everything that we do, we have to go back and research. You also have to trust the person. You also have to trust your mentor. You can't go to someone that you don't trust and uh, you know they don't have your best interest at heart or you feel that they don't have your best interest at heart. Now, the one thing about a mentor and um, my students know and um, as well as um, young attorneys that I mentor right now, I'm giving back, I'm, I definitely give back. So if a, a young attorney comes to me and says, hey, I have a question, I'm answering it or I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell them, hey, I'm gonna try to figure it out. Um, one thing that your mentor will not do if you call your mentor and say, hey, I hate to keep bothering you, they're gonna say, you're not bothering me. This is important, you know? Um, so you wanna find someone that's like that. Um, you also, not someone that, that is, um, they wanna be the mentor because they just want to um, seem important run away from those. Um, someone you're comfortable with and someone you have a relation with, re relationship with. So your resources, you have attorneys in your hometown, you have professors, believe, believe it or not, professors care, and we wanna see you do well. So um, if you trust us, uh, you're comfortable with us and you have a relationship with us and uh, we have experience, then you can ask. Uh, relatives that are attorneys, um, my father-in-law, my sister-in-laws, I bother them all the time. Oh, well, love y'all. Um, my classmates, I contact them. I have a, a wonderful classmate in Belzoni, Mississippi, um, uh, Tanisha Gates. She was my roommate and we always talk. Um, she's, she's awesome. She's an awesome attorney. Uh, we have legal associations, uh, bar associations. Use your uh, bar associations. Definitely use your bar associations. Use the resources that are there. Uh, these legal associations, there are different um, different uh, parts of the, they branch from the bar as well as they've created their own types of societies. Magnolia Bar Association is one of them um, that I know right off, right off hand. So use those. Um, there's, there are resources for individuals that public defenders, uh, criminal law, family law, young lawyers uh, uh, section as well. And networking, it is important to network. I know some of you say, oh, I don't like to network. It's so much work. It's not, just talk to people. Uh, you're an attorney, learn how to say hi, bye, whatever it is and hold a conversation. Um, that has gotten me so far with just establishing relationships with people and talking. Um, so we found a mentor and we have a legal support team. Um, now we need to look at the law office as a bifurcated entity. It's a small business. So you can start off as a small business. Some law offices end up being big 
big, big, huge law offices. Uh, we know a bunch of them uh, here in uh, in Baton Rouge, uh, different areas, uh, Mississippi. I practice out of Mississippi. So it's a bifurcated entity. You have a business side and you have a legal side. Uh, your business side, you deal with the financials, the taxes, the expenses, your business structure, different loans. Um, so this is the money side of it, really. Um, and it, I mean, it requires a lot of work. Uh, I didn't understand it when I first got in. Um, and I started watching my father-in-law and the different things that um, he had to deal with. And I mean, keeping the lights on. Um, you know, uh, that that's something that happens. Um, you have to have all of these things for, he has a, a physical office, so you have to have all of these things, but then the taxes, you have to deal with taxes. Okay, I don't know anything about taxes, so I wanna go to someone uh, that can be a resource to me, um, get an accountant, uh, talk with the people at the IRS. Um, there, there are a lot of ways that you can figure out your tax structure as well and your tax structure will be uh, dictated by your business structure. Um, and you wanna look at your financials, um, see what you have coming in. If you're going in uh, to a law office, with, and we're gonna talk about that if you don't have any money. <laughs> Some people have money and they're able to uh, do bigger things. Just because you don't have a lot of money does not mean that you can't start a law office. But, and we're gonna talk about that. The legal side. Well, you still, you have financial there, but it's the legal side of it. It doesn't have anything to do with um, the business, uh, so say, as far as the business side of it, but it's the legal side. If you don't pay your bar dues, um, you can't practice anymore. That doesn't mean that you can't run a business, not a law office. You can't run a law office, but um, that does not mean that you can't run a business. So that's why I say it's bifurcated. Um, you have filing fees, that's an expense. You have office expenses, supplies, malpractice insurance, office, office equipment, salaries, wages, et cetera. Um, so we have resources from the Small Business Administration that can help us with the business side of it. Um, the ABA can help us with the legal side, the State Bar Association, the legal side, the Secretary of State can help us with the business side and the IRS can help us with the business side as well. All right, so now, which most attorneys do not do is create a business plan. We need a business plan. We need to understand what we're trying to do, uh, what monies we have, What's the idea? What's the makeup of, uh, of this law office? Of course, every law office is not the same. Everybody doesn't do everything the same. Um, some law offices are more organized than other law offices. Um, and that is a big thing. Organization in, um, in becoming a small solo firm or wanting to be a larger firm, there must be some type of organization. So this business plan is just one step of it in understanding how the financial portion of it um, works. So you want to take an inventory of where you are. Do I have any money? Um, where, do I, where do I want to create my office? Do I want a physical office or do I want a virtual office? And we'll get to that. Um, determine where you want to go. What is your goal with this law office? How much money do you want to make? Um, you know, or is, and what type of law office is it? Um, if you're doing family law, you can you can make some money, but you might have to do some other things on the side. Um, if you're doing a personal injury firm, you know it's 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 unlimited. Um, if you're going to represent different companies, uh, if you're going to be a defense firm, uh, it just depends on what your setup is. But you need to build a map to get there. Business plans are dying art, especially in the legal profession. However, it is in the best interest to create it, um, and the Small Business Association can help you with that as well. All right, so we moved on from our business plan. Now we need to name our firm. We need to, what, what's in our name? Uh, there are different rules. If you look at rule 7.5, um, it will guide you ABA rule 7.5, but uh, wherever you're practicing, you must look at the rules that um, dictate, these are just the basic rules. It, you went to law school, so you know we only teach you the basics. You gotta go get the real meat and potatoes um, out there. So 
Uh, what's in the name? Um, to name your law firm, the ABA Rule 7.5 says that um, you must check your state specifics, but you can't have any misleading or false names. Um, so you can't um, have individuals, you can't say that you're practicing in an area of law that you're not even practicing in. You can't say that you're a criminal defense attorney um, and, and have that in the, in, your, in the name of your law office and you don't do any criminal defense. You don't do anything. Um, so you can't mislead with your, uh, with your letterhead. You can't mislead with your retainer agreements. You can't mislead in your advertising. That includes all of that. Um, some, some states recognize trade names. Those states are Arizona, Iowa, New York, Ohio, uh, Mississippi, I'm sorry, they don't allow trade names. That is uh, Arizona, Iowa, New York, Ohio, Mississippi, and Texas. I think there may be some more. Texas is going through a lawsuit right now. They just started in June, as well as New York, um, where a law firm is suing them. And I think they're actually going to end up changing it. Um, I, I know New York has already changed. I think it was like June 5th, 2020, um, they actually changed it. Um, so Texas is going through the same thing as well. And they may end up changing it where you can use trade names. Trade names do not, um, they, some states say you have to include the last name of the individuals that, that will be working there uh, or will be working in the firm. But you can use um, different, you know, the accident lawyer, a trade name. Um, you, can, you can do that. Um, divorce court. I mean, I'm just making up stuff. Y'all know how I make up things. So, uh, <laughs> different trade names. And so Florida and Louisiana do permit trade names, um, but they require that um, it, it has to be used on the letterhead and pleadings. Um, you can't use the names of the individuals. You can't uh, revert on the letterhead and use the name of the individuals. You have to use that trade name. So look at your state and see um, what they require as far as trade names are concerned. We also have associations. Um, so my father-in-law's uh, law office is Morris and Associates. He actually has associates. You can't say I'm starting a solo firm, and so I I say Morris Morris and Associates, and it's just me. There has to be an associate. So most states require that. There are other rules. Um, you can't have associations with government agencies. Make it seem as if you're working with um you know the workforce commission you can't you can't put that in the uh the name so check out rule 7.5 um to look and see um to look and see what um you know what is required within your state all right so i have a case example here we have an attorney that was licensed in dc and no other states they were uh, this attorney was previously licensed in illinois signed a retainer agreement um, with the client in Maryland and two retainers with one in Virginia. The problem was that the attorney did not reveal to them that, she, that this attorney was not licensed in either one of those uh, places and only in DC. So that was a violation of rule 7.1 and rule 7.5. 7.1 says that um, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to make a false and misleading communication about the lawyer or the lawyer's services. So her false communication was on that retainer, uh, those retainer agreements that she was, she was basically licensed in Maryland and Virginia. Um, and also 7.5, a lawyer should not use a firm name, letterhead, or other professional designation that violates rule 7.1. So you know when a rule uh, talks about another rule, you got to go read the other rule. So this was a violation. You can look at other ones. Um, I tend to read the disciplinary, um, and I know that seems crazy, but I go back and I read disciplinary uh, charges so I can see exactly what they did, uh, why, why the courts said, or why the, uh, the association says, hey, you know, you did this. So I don't make the same mistakes. Um, we, you know, we hear bar, we, you know, we kind of clam up. Um, you don't need to be afraid of the bar as long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing at the time that you're supposed to be doing it. So don't go out in fear. Just go out and seek the proper knowledge. And before you make a move, consult the rules. Consult the rules before you make any moves. Consult the rules and make sure what you're doing 
is proper and correct. And then you won't, you won't have to be afraid of the bar. Um, and we'll talk about clients in a little while as well. <laughs> but the rules differ for state to state. So make sure that you're not taking what I have here. This is the basics, uh, very basic. All right, so now we need to reserve our names. Now here comes the business side of this, of all of this. Okay, we, I got a name, I can just go out and start taking cases. No, you cannot. You must register your business with the state where you're going to practice. Okay, so you go to the Secretary of State, the Secretary of State allows you to reserve your name. Once you reserve your name, the name that you've created for your law firm, then you can get your employment identification number from the IRS and you begin your business formation. It is a process. Uh, Louisiana is gobiz.com. You can go there and do everything online. It's, it's beautiful because you never have to go and take a paper to someone. So your whatever state you're practicing in, uh, I'm sure their secretary of state has some kind of way for you to register your business online. It doesn't take long. Um, it, it's not really a long process, depending on what structure. Um, I did a nonprofit and oh my gosh, it, it took me a while because I was like, what is going on? I had to have all kinds of stuff notarized. So um, this wasn't, this process wasn't that long in uh, getting the business started. So check out your um, state secretary of state and uh, register to obtain um, the EIN online. You could do that with the IRS. They give it to you in a couple of minutes. You can register for the EIN. Do not register for the EIN before you reserve your name. I did it in that order on purpose. You need to reserve the name first because what happens when you get an EIN and you signed up with a reserved name and you go back and they say, oh, that name isn't available. So now you have to go get another EIN. Simple as that. Start with the Secretary of State first. All right, so here we go with our business formation. We need to, un we need to figure out what type of business we want. Do we want a limited liability company, a limited partnership, a limited liability partnership, a sole proprietorship, a corporation? There are other ones out there. I'm not the guru on business formation, so I'm, I, I'm not gonna even try to go there with you guys. Um, and I'm limited on time, we're doing lunch, so <laughs> I wanna get you out of here as soon as possible and um, let you uh, be able to ask any questions that you wanna ask. Um, you will need to register your business, choose a business formation, consult with a tax professional, tax attorney, accountant, or small business association in your state, they can help you. Uh, it's a process, but it's not a long process, guys, to get this started. Um, but you, you know, you definitely have to go through the business portion of it. All right, these are the different business types, um, and so just make sure that you decide on a business type that is good for your organization. Um, if you have a group of people that are going to do the business together, uh, then you need to decide on what what structure are you going in by yourself? It just, it just depends. Um, so you can look those up in your state as well. Um, now, we need to figure out what type of office are we going to have, okay? A physical office or a virtual office? Well, the virtual office is the new law office. We've been virtual uh, since we moved back since like 2012. I think it's 2012, I think. Um, so we've been virtual uh, since then. We don't have a physical office. We work out of our home. And um, I know sometimes I cringe when I think about it because I wanted this big office. And then I think about the overhead and I say, oh, okay, no, I, I can deal with it. Actually, um, maybe two houses down from me, there's another lawyer that works from home as well. Uh, which I think is beautiful because we talk all the time and um, she tells me uh, how great it is um, with her virtual office. And I'm like, wow, you know, and when COVID hit, we didn't miss a beat. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Physical office is beautiful as well. I've worked out of my father-in-law's office as well and um, beautiful experience also. Um, I can't say that I wouldn't want to go back to a physical office. Uh, I don't want the bills though. I'm, I think I'm smarter at this point because I worked in a physical office and I've had a virtual, virtual office. Um, I know what it, what it will cost. Um, and I just don't want overhead and I don't also don't want to have to pay anybody for an office as well, but to each its own. 
it, it doesn't matter. So let's talk about the pros and cons of these uh, law firm structures. The physical office, you have overhead. The virtual office, you have minimal overhead. Well, you got to live if you're doing it out of your house. It's still overhead, but you get two things in one. The physical office, um, your overhead could consist of, um, it depends on what you want in your office. You definitely have to have lights. You definitely have to have internet. Um, you must have internet. Um, so you got the lights, uh, you have to have water because you're going to have to use the restroom unless you, you know, you want to run up to the store or something. I don't know. Um, not my business, but, uh, you know, it, you'll have overhead. Um, you also have your office expenses. If you're renting or leasing, um, if you put a mortgage on it, you'll also have that overhead as well. So the physical office does have more expenses. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of a con, uh, with the physical office and the virtual office has less expenses. Um, you need furniture for the physical office. You already have furniture for the virtual, virtual office. There's travel associated with the physical office because you actually have to get up, you know, um, get dressed, go out. Um, and you don't have to do that with the virtual office. Um, you honestly could be in your pajamas. I don't work in my pajamas. I think it's, you know, but hey, I don't work in my pajamas, but people do it. Um, physical office, the renting and leasing, the virtual office, um, you have less distractions. When I say less distractions in the physical office, it's almost like sometimes you can't get work done because you have people coming in and out of the office. Now, the blessing in that is you have a location and people know where you are and they might be driving by and say, okay, you know what? I need to go talk to an attorney just it happens that's the that's the pros of that you know you have an actual physical law office some people um because we were virtual um they didn't want to hire us because they were like oh you don't have a law office you must be poor <laughs> you know you're not a and, and so there are stigmas and we're going to talk about those stigmas as well um they don't look at it as saying mm, well you just don't want overhead so that doesn't make you not have money it, or you know and people tend to look at that or uh, make you unprofessional or anything. They just, that's just the way they think sometimes. Um, so the rental and lease insurance. So you, if you have a physical office, of course you have to protect that office. You also have to protect the individuals coming in and out of that office as well. So if there's, uh, there's some trap uh, when you walk in the door, there's a hole and somebody falls into that hole, you don't want to have to pay for that because you're already paying for everything else. So you have to have that liability insurance, the premises liability insurance. If the office burns, God forbid, um, you wanna have some type of uh, lease or rental insurance or just insurance on the building itself. Um, if you work out of, out of your home, you already have insurance on your home. So it's, you know, and most people, uh, if they work from home, they don't have individuals uh, coming to their home in that virtual office. They either go to a shared space with someone else um, or do, if you have to do a deposition or interview a client, you go somewhere else. Um, so that's one of the cons of the uh, virtual office uh, also. Um, you, you have a lack of meeting space. Um, there are distractions in the physical office, like I said, and less distractions in the virtual office. Um, there's more work flexibility in the virtual office. Yeah, I can get up at four o'clock in the morning um, three o'clock in the morning sometimes and work and then get back in the bed at four or five and wake right back up at six or seven and uh, start breakfast, a load of clothes and then go back to work in the virtual office. The physical office, I'm there. I'm just there. And I, if I get there at three in the morning, I'm there. I might have to fall asleep in my chair if I need some more, um, <laughs> you know, some more sleep. Um, the virtual office allows you to separate. Uh, I mean, it, it, the con of it is you can't separate home, work and home life, especially now because we're virtual. Um, you know, I have kids, so my kids are virtual with me. Um, so it's hard. My husband, my son called me this morning and said, hey, mom, um, are you fixing breakfast before you leave? Wow, kid. Okay, thanks. But I mean, that's it. I can't separate myself uh, from that. Like I said, I get up, put a load of clothes in and, you know, 
may switch them out. So there's no separation. Um, with the law firm, the physical office, you have the clothing expense, the virtual office, you really don't because, I mean, you can put on jogging pants and work. Um, it just depends unless you're having a Zoom meeting or something. Um, then the physical office, there's also an uh, option to do office sharing. And uh, the virtual office, you're already, you know, you're just there. Um, so security, that's one thing that I want to talk about with this physical office. You need some type of security. I was a clerk, um, a law clerk uh, for a local attorney here. And when I stayed, there was so much security in this man's building. Um, there was an alarm system. There were, um, the fence was, you could, you had to be buzzed in to get into the fence. You had to be buzzed in to get into the office. Once you got into the office, there was a locked door. The uh, receptionist, the, the paralegal, um, and the secretary all sat behind this plexiglass that they could only open. I mean, he had so much security. And I was like, okay, this is overkill. Like, why does this man have all the security? It's just kind of wide, you know, I'm like, it's wide open. Um, well, not until I was in Mississippi um, and we were, um, actually knew this attorney, um, Ellis Pittman, and um, he was doing a deposition. He was suing someone and doing a deposition and the guy that he was suing was in the deposition. Uh, the attorney for that, that, um, that person, uh, the defendant was walking out and all of a sudden heard all of these shots. Well, this man killed this attorney in his own office. He shot and killed him in his own office. So that answered my question for me. There is a need for security. There is a need for security. I can't say it enough. Um, you may not have the burglar bars and the alarms and all these kind of things, but you need to be aware of what's going on. Uh, around you and your surroundings if you're going to have a physical office. And I can't, I can't state that enough. Um, you know, even in courtrooms now, uh, after this murder, um, I'm, you know, I'm very aware of my surroundings. Not that I wasn't before, but now I am very aware of my surroundings because you just never know, especially in criminal court. Uh, you see them on TV all the time. They break out fighting. We're like, oh my God, they're you know they're fighting and it's funny, but it's really not funny when you're when you're caught in that situation or a client wants to attack you, um, a client from the other side wants to attack you. It's it's scary. It's very very scary. So don't bring those uh, things to your office. Make sure that you have some type of security um, and that you're aware of your surroundings and who's coming in and who's coming out. Um, and make sure that the people in your office are safe as well. Um, because you may be opening yourself up for liability there if uh, one of your employees is is injured um, on the job and you didn't have proper security. I think of everything as an attorney now, and I'm, I'm sure you guys do as well, uh, but you may be liable for that also. So that physical office and that virtual office, you have to look and say, okay, what, you know, which, which one do I want? Uh, what's the best one for me? Um, so let's talk about law office needs and requirements. Um, we need office equipment. We must have office equipment. What's the thing that we definitely need the most? A computer. We have to have a computer. You have to have a good working computer. I see people work on laptops all the time, iPads. You need a good old fashioned desktop. You do. Um, you can transfer, my husband has right now, where right now, if he's working on a document, I can actually pull the document up and see what he's doing at the same time. Uh, we did it last night, we're working on a memorandum together, and he's, you know, he's looking at it, um, and I'm looking at it at the same time so that we could kind of bounce um, our computers, talk to each other. I don't know how, how it happens, but, you know, y'all have to ask him. I have no idea in the world what's going on. Um, but it's some type of system that he set up and I think it's beautiful because uh, we don't have to keep emailing things back and forth to each other uh, like we used to do. So those that office equipment and supplies, you'll definitely need that. Um, supplies can range. I never knew how many supplies you needed until I became an attorney. Um, you got to have a telephone system. You must have some way of your clients reaching you. Our telephones, we have a system with, um, I can't think of the name, 
Uh, I'll think of the name in a few a few minutes. But uh, our telephone system, we have an 800 number. Um, we also have local numbers as well. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go all the way out and do a bunch of things, but that telephone system that you have, you need to have it where you can you can have uh, voicemails. Um, you can receive, some people have the virtual assistance as well. So you just need to look up that, that information, but definitely make sure that your telephone system uh, is working in, in proper order so that your clients can get in touch with you. Uh, computers, the software for the computers. Um, I laugh because when I teach, um, I, every year that I teach, someone says they don't, they don't have Adobe PDF. I'm like, what? How do you not have Adobe? You're going to have to have this as an attorney. So you need some type of PDF system. Adobe is not the only one, but you do need a PDF system. Um, you need a printer and a reliable printer that, that, um, you know, that actually does the work that you need. In most, in the federal courts right now, you can file online. So it's not as much paper. We're trying to cut back on paper. Um, I think Louisiana has actually gone to the district court, if I'm not mistaken, I think the 19 JDC, you can actually file online now, especially after COVID. They finally got with the program and said, okay, we don't want people coming in here. So now you can actually file online. So some state courts, you can file online now. And um, definitely the federal court, it is never closed. It's basically never closed. So you can always, uh, not physically, it's not open, but that ECF, what they call ECF filing, electronic court filing is always open. So, um, but you do need that printer uh, just in case you have to physically give a uh, original copy, which you usually do when you're filing a petition. Um, you need a scanner. You definitely need a scanner. Um, and you're, they have scanners that are connected to the printer. Um, so you can do that also. You need a, a copier um, of some sort, which can also be included in the printer as well. Fax machine. Now, this says if you, you know, if you think you need one, most people say, okay, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I need a fax. Well, some, sometimes that's if you need an emergency, uh, something sent to you quickly and people don't have access to emails because there are people that do not have emails. They don't know how to scan. Um, they don't know how to put, uh, they don't know how to do any of that. And so all they know how to do is fax. And I've had those clients that all they do is fax. Uh, we have a virtual fax, and so what happens is with, I think it's with Ring Central. Ring Central is one of the, the companies. Um, they dial the fax number, and wherever they're faxing from, it just sends us an email. It's basically an email. It converts it into an email, and we have an email box just set up for our faxes, and that's how we get all our faxes. The beauty in that is the paper is, we don't have to use paper. It's never misplaced because it's in an organized file. And if somebody says, you know, I didn't receive your fax, uh, which opposing counsel will do all the time, I never got a fax from you, it shows where they got the fax. Um, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, and that's coming and going. So um, you'll need that. Small things that you'll need, you'll need paper, envelopes, sticky notes, pens, pencils, staplers, three-hole punch, um, a date stamp. Some people use that file folders. Uh, Louisiana has those long file folders because they use the um, they use legal paper and not letter. Um, so it just depends. Um, rubber bands, tapes, binders, staple uh, staple remover, paper clips, uh, color sticky notes, and these come in handy if you're going to trial. It it, it just really does. Um, so those are types of office equipment. Staff, I want to talk a little bit about staff, and this is kind of, um, it won't be too long, but um, you need to monitor your staff. You're responsible for everything that your staff does, so you have to monitor them. And using um, in IOTA accounts um, and um, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, you have research resources that you will need, office systems and management, client management, and malpractice insurance. So your office systems, um, Clio is a good one that's out there right now. Case manager is out there as well. And we also have like law pay. That's another office system um, that you could use as well. Uh, client management, docketing, calendar, using the calendar 
to keep up with your um to keep up with prescription or statute limitations um you need a docketing sheet as well um, a, some type of system to docket your cases i can't tell you how many times we have client i mean um attorneys that come in and say oh i forgot it was court well how you didn't you know you didn't put it on your calendar you must have a calendar even if if, if it's on your phone I would suggest you do one on your phone and also do one like on Outlook or on your computer or something and they will, it will alert you of what you have coming up. Um, you need an accounting system, a time tracking and billing system, uh, filing and uh, conflict systems as well. And um, you can get resources from your attorney's ethics rule, Westlaw, LexisNexis, Clio, Case Manager and Law Pay. It's a bunch of other ones out there as well. Um, safekeeping property, this is a big one. So we have the client trust account um, and the interest on lawyers trust account, which is the IOTA. Um, it's used to hold the client's fund or property. Attorney acts as the fiduciary with regards to the client's funds. The attorney must not mismanage or mishandle uh, the CTA, which is the client trust account. Commingling of funds is prohibited. You cannot commingle funds. A lawyer shall never place his or her private funds with the client's funds. These funds must be kept separate. CTAs cannot be overdrawn. This is where people get in trouble, that co-mingling and overdrawing the account. Read up on rule 1.5, safekeeping of property, and you must keep meticulous records of the CTA. Um, oh, in some states, the IOTA account is not mandatory. Um, so you need to, you just need to check and see. So your, fidu your fiduciary duties for the client trust account to keep the money secure, to keep it in a step, to keep it separate from the attorney's personal funds and those of your law firm to notify the client with the settlement check comes in to appropriately disperse the money to those whom it belongs and to maintain accurate records reflecting all receipts and disbursements. All right, malpractice insurance, this protects you and uh, it's in case of a crisis, um, like somebody sues you, it protects your assets and your firm, it covers costs while dealing with claims and um, sometimes malpractice suits are caused by misrepresentation, violation of good faith and damages as a result of the lawyer's uh, action. So look into malpractice insurance, your state bar association, the ABA can tell you, guide you to a list of uh, malpractice insurance carriers. All right, so we're almost to the end and I, you know, I told y'all I talk a lot, I will go on and on and on, but this is important as well. The mentor, at the end of the day, the, the mentor is one thing, self-care is another as well these are two of the important things that i want you to get out of that getting someone to mentor you and also taking care of yourself you cannot take any of this with you god is not going to ask you when you die when you have your funeral um nobody's going to say they're going to say you're a lawyer but they're not going to i mean it's not going to be like a parade or anything you know every week because you were an attorney so you need to live you need to stay alive my students are probably laughing because I talk about this the first day that I meet them. What are you eating? What are you drinking? What are you putting into your mind? Are you taking care of your physical health? So eat good stuff, practice mindfulness, meditation, relaxation, all of those things and prevent burnout. Uh, true self-care is not an excuse to escape from our lives, but rather a means to create a life we don't feel the need to escape from in the first place, okay? All right, so the last thing, pay it forward. Since you're becoming new attorneys that are starting law offices, help these attorneys that are coming out after you, um, after you've gotten your skills together and you know what you're doing, be a mentor to someone, okay? And I appreciate you for being with me today. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is to, it's the courage to continue that counts. And I appreciate each one of you for, uh, for being here. I'm going to now take um, questions. Um, okay, let's see. Let me look at the Q&A and I'll be able to tell you. Okay, so I think, does anybody have any questions? Okay, Ring Central for fax and Vonage for voice. Yes. Okay, it was Ring Central for fax and Vonage for voice. Um, 
does anybody have any questions or did I did I do a uh, complete job that you completely understand everything? Or does, is there anything that I need to go back on? Have the mentors been assigned under TIP for uh, Louisiana State Bar Association? Um, I don't. I don't know that. Um, I, I have no idea. Uh, I can try to find that out for you, though. And I'm not yeah. quite sure what type of mentorship program Louisiana State Bar Association has. The application that I sent out yesterday for all the students um, is a mentorship for students. So if the LSBA has a, a mentorship program, you probably would need to contact them to find out if uh, they have started assigning mentors for the requested mentees. Anyone else? Anyone have any questions for me? I'm here, y'all know I'm an open book. So if you have questions, um, you know, just like your mentor, you're not bothering me. I just want to uh, make sure I'm answering. Um, oh, okay. Someone says, uh, okay, what do you suggest for being of counsel, I, I think I don't. Um, type that back in. I, I don't understand it. I haven't been okay. Um, can you please explain more about your conflict software? Oh, okay. So the conflict software is not it's, it's not software. I'm sorry. Um, conflicts. What I was talking about is if you maybe work for. If you work for another company and let's say you get a client that comes in, you represent another client um, on something, then there may be a conflict of interest or there may be some type of, uh, there, there could be a lot of conflicts, usually in solo practitioners, with solo practitioners there, there aren't so many. Um, there was one that uh, we dealt with actually in my wills and trust class. Um, and the, the guy goes, they go in for to do an estate, and this is what I'm talking about with conflicts. They go in to do an estate, and uh, it's the husband and wife, but the husband has a baby by someone else, and so this young lady comes to the firm, and um, they typed his name in room. That's a conflict. They can't represent him. They can't represent her for paternity. So these are the type of conflicts that I'm talking about if you if you get what I'm saying. So it's not really a software. Um, it's, it's more so keeping track of who the clients are and uh, what you're dealing with. If that's if that's what you were asking. I hope that's what you were asking. Uh, being oh of counsel is just saying you are part of a particular. Yes, yes, yes. That's fine. Of counsel uh, is fine. I'm sorry, I didn't, I guess I didn't read that right. Um, yeah, so you can do of, um, of counsel, that's, and, and that's fine. That's just saying you're, you're with this law firm, like my, our law firm is named Daniel E. Morris Law Firm, and my name is nowhere on there, but I'm of counsel, I'm, I'm with that firm, and that's where I identify um, and how I sign everything. Um, Okay. All right. Anybody else have any other questions? And this is just a short series. You can come back for um, our, our uh, end of the year series that um, Professor Dickerson is going to um, advertise as well. And one thing I didn't say with marketing and advertising, every Every chance, every time that you're somewhere is an opportunity to advertise who you are. Um, my husband has shirts um, that have been made. Uh, we, we wear those shirts. Um, we, and, and it's not just t-shirts, like it's professional uh, embroidered shirts that we have. Um, and um, we use our business cards. Um, we talk, we network, we talk to people. Uh, I started out in the beginning, honestly, y'all, it was so crazy because I would see people and they would have a boot on their leg and I'm like, what, what happened to you? You know? Uh, so, I mean, 
every chance that you get is a chance to market yourself. Um, so you want to watch what you're doing. You want to watch the way that you look when you go out. Um, you want to watch the way that you treat people. You talk to people because every chance is, you know, is a chance to market yourself. And it's not enough for you to, to look like you're a serious person. You also have to be a serious person and um, be serious about the business that you're running as well. But every chance is a chance to market, uh, market yourself and market your firm as a, um, you know, yourself as an attorney. Uh, so watch what you're doing and, uh, and where you are as well. Um, let's see. I don't know if we have any more questions. We have about five minutes. So if you have any other questions or things that you think I didn't touch on. Um, and my classmate says, being of counsel, I usually place that in my heading. I work of counsel for other firm while working for myself. Yes. Uh, what's the biggest expense for a physical office? Probably, probably the rent uh, or the lease, um, unless you have a mortgage. That's that's the biggest expense. Um, now we didn't even get into the expenses of having to pay like filing fees, paying for um, um, paying for different cases like experts on the cases, medical records. Um, I tried to include as much as possible within the. Um, within the resources that I gave you as well. Um, so, but the biggest will probably be the mortgage. Now, I, you know, if you, if you take a, a criminal case and you require uh, an expert uh, for a criminal case, um, you know, it could be on anything, a gun expert, uh, that could cost you some good money. Now the client is the one that's supposed to pay it, but guess what? Um, so watch when you're taking these cases and, and I'm going to talk about that in the series, vetting, um, these, uh, different clients and looking at the different clients and what cases you, how to tell if you should take the case. Do you have any rules about communicating with clients over text messages? For example, random questions about how to proceed further with child custody. Matter? Um, I, I, I text my clients all the time communication. And that's something else I didn't touch on. I'm sorry. I, I ran too fast. But communication, you must document everything. Um, text messages to me are a good way of documenting and having an individual, um, you know, relate what they're saying back to you. Uh, I wouldn't do emojis and all that kind of stuff because that could be construed a different way. But um, yeah, you can, I use text messages all the time, all the time. Um, but how to proceed if it's something that is, um, I don't, that, that question, if it's something that, um, you know, that is like social security numbers and stuff like that, if it's, it's proprietary information, I wouldn't send that out. But, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't do that over a text message or social security cards or anything like that. I wouldn't do that. But I, I mean, discussions are fine. Cybersecurity insurance, I don't know anything about cybersecurity insurance. I've, I've had a CLE on cybersecurity, um, but with your male practice insurance, I don't know if that could be included. I can check on that for you. Uh, engagement and disengagement letters, um, that is included in my, um, in the beneficial forms. Um, if you're engaging with someone and you're taking their case, you want to send uh, a client engagement letter with the retainer agreement, um, and if you if it's contingency or just a regular, um, uh, you know, a regular um, fee fee agreement, then that that would be your engagement letter. Now, the disengagement letter is very important in that if you're disengaging with a client and saying, "Okay, I, I'm not doing your case anymore." You must tell them the statute of limitations. You must do that. The statute of limitations are prescription. I, I say statute of limitations because I'm common law. But you must tell them when, when their case is going to prescribe. Um, let's see. Thank you for this. Benefit. Okay. Um, my question is about share space. How does this work? Okay. So share space, you may go into an office um, with someone and there is, they may be, they may be an attorney as well. I have a friend that does share space. You just pay the portion of the rent 
whatever it is to uh, rent that portion of the property. It may be, you know, $500, $600, a thousand. It just depends. And you just, y'all all have these common areas, almost like, you know, sharing an apartment in college. That's a shared space. Um, there's also where you can just rent a space for a hundred dollars a month and it's nothing but a cubicle. So it, it's, it's a lot of them out there. You're welcome. Did I miss anybody? And then cybersecurity, I'm gonna look at that. Uh, cybersecurity insurance, I'm, a, I'm, I'm gonna look at that because um, I've never really touched on that. Um, I hope I answered the question about communication, um, but document everything, guys. Don't, don't go in with the clients um, and you know just think I don't have to document this. Make sure you have documentation of everything. Um, there's a form on there where you can list everything that has gone on in a case as well. Uh, get that form and look at forms pass. I included that. Uh, you can look You can look on your uh, Bar Association website and they can give you some information too. I ran out of time. So if you have any questions, um, you, can, you can email me um, and I'll, you know, I'll answer anything that you have, but come back for our next series on being fierce in the practice of law. And I appreciate all of the graduates that sent me pictures as well. They look beautiful and um, like models. All right. Thank you all. So our next uh, CLE is on Tuesday, the 29th. It's the Social Justice uh, Roundtable. Talk with attorney um, Brittany K. Barnett, who also just wrote a uh, award-winning book. Um, and next Friday, our second edition of Becoming Fierce uh, in a Practice of Law will occur. Um, it's entitled, I Have a Case, Now What? So um, it's go we're going to go over pleadings, and we have um, Judge Nicole Shepard from New Orleans, and we also have Attorney Dwazendra Smith, who practices between the Acadiana parishes and, um, well, actually, she, she practices all over Southeast Louisiana and Southwest Louisiana. So um, I look forward to you all um, being there, and I hope you all enjoyed the series today. Uh, Professor Janara Morris, thank you so much for importing your wisdom to everyone, um, and everyone has, have a good day.